Welcome. This is vocal health information for therapists, specifically intended for physical, occupational, and speech therapists, but certainly applicable to anyone else who uses their voice to make a living. It was originally presented as a Lunch and Learn on March 17th at Altru Health System, and I am Louise Pinkerton. I am a certified speech language pathologist, and I also have a master's degree in voice performance and a master's degree in speech language pathology. The first question is, why are we talking about vocal health? Well, from the standpoint of speech therapists and all the other therapists, voice is really our primary tool. We are professional voice users. Our voice is required for what we're doing in almost all situations. And imagine being able to do your practice or do your teaching or do your work without being able to use your voice. So we need to know how to take care of our voice so we can keep that primary tool available to us. Furthermore, um, in April, there is a worldwide celebration of the voice, World Voice Day on the 16th, and this is an early activity for the World Voice Day celebration. You may also wonder why is a speech-language pathologist talking to me about vocal health? Well, speech-language pathology covers a wide variety of disorders and areas, and the way voice fits into that is that we are experts on the larynx with swallowing, with speech production, and we're also specialists on how the voice vibrates and functions and works. Some of us have chosen to become specialized in this area. I've completed advanced coursework as a performer and also advanced coursework in the area of voice and vocology. So it's not something we typically run into every day with speech language pathology, but it's definitely an area where we provide education and therapeutic rehabilitation and intervention. This course will run about 20 to 30 minutes, and at the end of the course, you'll know and be able to describe vocal anatomy and physiology in basic terms, what some of the components of vocal hygiene are, and then what to do if problems occur, as well as some things you can do on a regular basis to keep your voice in shape and healthy. Now we're going to talk about producing voice. There are three main systems involved in this. The first is respiration, then there is phonation, and then resonance. So respiration is relating to using the breath, breathing in, and using it to start the phonation or get the vocal folds vibrating. And then those vibrations or sound waves will go through the vocal tract above the vocal folds and resonate, producing the sound we hear when people talk and sing. We'll start with respiration. This is the act of breathing, the air coming into your lungs and going out of your lungs. And that air going out of the lungs is what's going to put the vocal folds in vibration and allow you to produce voice. The way breathing works, the respiration works, is when the air is coming in, through your mouth and your nose, it's going to go into your lungs, and there are some changes that have to be made for this to happen. The diaphragm, which is a muscle that lines the underside of the lungs, is going to contract and pull down. The ribs are going to elevate and open the rib cage. Those two things combine to lower the pressure within the lungs. When that pressure is lowered, the air will be pulled in. Then what happens when you go to talk or when you're exhaling is the diaphragm relaxes. It doesn't actually contract. It just relaxes back to its default position. The lungs compress. The ribs come back down and together. And you can have, you'll have the air exiting. There is both passive and active exhalation. One is you just breathe in and then the diaphragm relaxes and you breathe out. When we are talking, we need a certain amount of pressure to get the voice right here to vibrate. So what we may actually do is be actively involved in compressing the ribs down a little bit, 
bringing the belly in a little bit to keep the right pressure level to get the voice produced as we exhale. Ideally with all of this we want the best performance for the least amount of work. So when we're breathing in we don't want to do any more than we need to. When we're exhaling we don't want to do any more than we need to. One thing about exhalation that I want you to keep in mind is that if the diaphragm contracts and moves this way, everything that's underneath it has to move. And the only place our viscera can move is out. So you actually need your abdominal wall to be relatively rela relaxed and allow your digestive tract and your viscera to expand out just a little bit when breathing in. Some people do the reverse of this, which is functional. Um, it's not necessarily the most efficient. Before we go on with phonation, let's talk a little bit about anatomy. This is a picture or a schematic of the vocal folds from a superior view. So if anyone's had a scope done at the ENT that goes through their nose and over the back of their tongue and looks down into their throat, it's as if we're looking straight down the windpipe or straight into the larynx. The top of the picture is anterior, so you can imagine that this is lined up so it would be the arrow points to the front of your neck. We have several items here in the larynx that we're going to look at. The first thing is the vocal folds themselves. There are these white strips on either side, and they actually extend all the way underneath the gray that's above them. And that is what comes together and vibrates. Above those, we have the false vocal folds. So right here, they generally speaking do not vibrate, except in extreme circumstances. You can listen to Louis Armstrong singing, and he uses some false vocal fold vibration. Then we have the tips of some cartilages. They're under mucosa here, but we have the arytenoid cartilages in back, and they will actually bring the vocal folds together. So then the vocal folds will meet at the center here. Okay. There are other cartilages involved with the larynx. There's the thyroid cartilage that runs along here and provides a lot of the format and structure. There's a cricoid cartilage, which is right at the top of the trachea and is a circular cartilage. And then down here, we can see the tracheal rings and we can see right into the windpipe there. This brings us to phonation and it is about getting the vocal folds to vibrate. During speech production, your vocal folds will vibrate between 800 and 260 times per second. That's measured in hertz or cycles per second. And this vibration isn't caused by muscle movement. You're not actually bringing the vocal folds together and apart that many times a second. Our muscles just don't move that fast. It's due to some really cool physics. And what happens is you will bring the vocal folds together and hold them in the central position or medial position. And then the air underneath will get strong enough to blow the vocal folds apart. And that air will start a sound wave because the air goes through and opens the vocal folds up. Then because they're muscle and they have elasticity and because there's some cool physics things going on like the Bernoulli effect, those vocal folds will close together again. But then that airflow underneath will build up enough pressure that it will open the vocal folds and we have this continued cycle of oscillation or vibration. Again, it's not muscle contractions that make the vocal folds vibrate. It is this oscillation produced by airflow and the muscles and fun physics stuff. Some things to keep in mind with your own voice use is when you make a louder sound, there is going to be increased impact of the vocal folds together when they come back to the middle. And when we talk too soft, sometimes being softer protects the voice, but being too soft actually gives you a low quality sound and you're really not letting the voice vibrate efficiently or effectively. So both of those extremes you want to avoid.
The YouTube link listed under the picture will take you to an animation of vocal fold vibration. Really interesting if you enjoy those kinds of things. Back to some anatomy as we head towards resonance. Your vocal folds are right down here and your larynx is right here. It's at the top of the trachea which leads down to your lungs and it is right in front of the esophagus that leads to your stomach. The entire area from above the vocal folds into the throat up through the nasal cavities and in through the mouth when it's open is your vocal tract and the shape of that vocal tract will determine the sounds you make. It determines how the sound waves are shaped. And this is an example of a transnasal examination. The ENT or the SLP has an endoscope that will go in the nose, through the nasal cavity, over the back of the tongue, and can look down and see what's going on with the vocal folds. That brings us to resonance. Resonance is the process of filtering the sound wave produced by the vocal folds as it goes through your throat and your mouth and your nose. What this does is it changes the sound. The, what you would hear right at the vocal fold sounds nothing like what our voices sound like coming out. It produces the individual quality of each person's voice because our structure and how we use it is different. And what that resonance can do is it can inhibit or boost certain aspects of the sound wave. So we can use our resonance to make our voice louder and project better without putting extra effort in at the vocal folds. We can also use our resonance to inhibit the sound of the voice. Resonance is something that can be trained. We all learn it just by using our voice, but we can, we can be trained in it to produce different sounds. And that's where speech language pathologists or, for example, a private voice teacher would come in. Now we're going to move on to vocal health and hygiene. We'll look at systemic care, things you can do for your body overall that will help your voice stay healthy. We'll look at ways you can use your voice and habits you may want to change or reinforce that will continue your vocal hygiene efforts, and then we'll look at rehabilitation or what happens when you think you might have a voice problem or if you do end up uh, having voice difficulties. One thing I want, do want to say right now is that there are many times when people feel like they shouldn't have voice problems or they should have been able to figure it out earlier or the voice should just always be there for them. And the thing about vocal health is I like to compare it to oral health or oral hygiene. People started teaching you how to take care of your teeth, sometimes even before you had teeth. And you receive education in school about oral hygiene and you visit the dentist once or twice a year. And you learn things throughout your life and the medical system reinforces taking care of your teeth and taking care of your oral cavity or your oral hygiene. Very rarely, unless someone studies performance, do we receive training in how to use our voice in a healthy way or how to keep our voice healthy? So if you do run into a voice problem or if you are frustrated with how your voice is working, keep in mind that this is largely new information for you and that we don't make a great effort to teach people how to use our voice in a healthy way. One of the ideas to keep in mind with your voice is anything you do that affects your entire body will probably affect your voice. To start with, hydration is very important. The vocal folds themselves are covered with a thin layer of mucosa or mucous membrane like what's in your nose and it needs to be nice and hydrated so it can vibrate and not stick to each other. And it just, the voice vibrates and functions and works better in a hydrated body. That means both drinking enough water as well as potentially keeping the air that you're breathing in and out hydrated. Some of the things to think about with hydration is for a long time there were numbers that were out there about how many ounces of fluid you needed a day. 
What they've kind of found with additional research is that actually urine color is the best measure of hydration. If your body has enough water, it will dump excess fluid and your urine will be pale. If you're not getting enough water, your urine tends to be darker, you know, certainly with the exception of taking any medications that would make urine darker. Sleep hygiene is also very important. In our day-to-day -day world, we have neglected and tended to deprioritize sleep but it is very important for your voice and a fatigued body means a fatigued voice or a fatigued body means you're not going to use your voice in an efficient manner because you're so tired and that's going to be detrimental. There's lots of information online about sleep hygiene and certainly if it's something you have difficulty with you can talk to your primary care provider. Along with sleep, stress is a very big factor in our culture and stress management is also important for the voice. It helps us keep our whole body relaxed so we're not adding extra tension when we're talking and just again helps us manage the emotional aspects that may be contributing to how we're talking and how we're using our voice. Reflux, either gastroesophageal reflux or laryngeal pharyngeal reflux are important to address if they're an issue. The gastroesophageal reflux is reflux coming from the stomach into the esophagus and then the laryngeal pharyngeal reflux is a stomach fluid or acids coming from the esophagus into the larynx and the throat. Sometimes they're both referred to as that same term of GERD or reflux. So if you've been told you have either, it's certainly something you want to look into. Again, many suggestions that you can find from reputable sources online. Think about avoiding eating within three hours of bedtime. Consider elevating the head of your bed so you're not getting reflux overnight. And looking at foods that may irritate it. Another factor that is very important for voice care is avoiding alcohol and tobacco. Alcohol is drying and it dehydrates you and also reduces your inhibition so you may not be monitoring how you're using your voice as well. And then tobacco uh, introduces a lot of toxic substances as well as hot air into the larynx, um, neither of which is good for the mucosa. And I should go, it's not just tobacco, vaping as well, marijuana as well, any inhaled uh, stimulant or drug like that can potentially have an issue. The other thing to keep in mind is alcohol and tobacco together have a synergetic effect on cancer. So the two of them together will increase the risk of laryngeal cancer and oral cancer. So good things to keep in mind or, or good reasons to think about addressing those issues. Also, systemically, you want to be aware of medications that will dry you out. Um, sometimes people are put on diuretics because they need to reduce fluid in their body. Sometimes it's a side effect of a medication like for some allergy medicines. For vocal health, I certainly do not make any recommendations with medication. But what you could do is talk to your pharmacist and see if that is a side effect of anything you are taking. And if it is and you feel that dryness or dehydration is an issue with your voice, then you need to have a discussion with your primary care physician or the prescribing physician about the risks and benefits of that particular medication or if there are other alternatives. Again, as a speech language pathologist, I would never tell you to stop taking a medication. I would tell you to get more information and discuss it with your care providers. So we've talked about things you can do in affecting your whole body or your whole system that keep your voice healthy. Let's talk about ways you use your voice or habitual patterns that will help you with healthy voice use. One important thing you can do as a professional voice user is to think about warming up and cooling down your voice. We certainly wouldn't go out and run a marathon without doing any kind of preparation and yet we do that with our voice every day and we also jump into great big times of voice use without necessarily preparation ahead of time. So we'll talk about some warm-ups and cool-downs that you can do, just little things for one or two minutes at the start and end of your day. Other habits you can build are to avoid traumatic voice use. This is things that cause your vocal folds to come together harshly or strongly with a lot of impact. So yelling, screaming, 
calling to people in other rooms. I have a hard time not doing that one. Um, grunting, like the Valsalva maneuver in exercising, all of those are considered traumatic to your voice. They're putting a lot of strain on it, um, a lot of physical impact. If you feel there are things you do that might be traumatic to your voice, you can work on trying to avoid them and certainly enlist the people around you to help you keep track of things that you want to avoid doing. Didn't mention it before, but a chronic cough or chronic throat clearing also can be very traumatic on the voice. We'd like to make our talking be at a moderate, a mild to moderate intensity most of the time. If we're too loud or too effortful, we are potentially hurting the voice or over long term can lead to issues. If we're too soft, we run into the issue of we're not providing enough breath for the vocal folds to vibrate the way they need to. And then it's hard for people to hear you and hard to be understood. Whispering, sometimes people think is a good strategy if their voice is bothering them. That's actually because of the sheer amount of breath flow it falls under the traumatic voice use. We'd rather you talk softly but normally than to whisper. Now, if you've heard people talk with a little bit of a growl in their sound, kind of like this, that's called vocal fry. You notice most people do it every once in a while, and I think I did it on the word fry. It's not bad for you per se, but it does show that your breath and your phonation aren't as balanced as they could be. Additionally, you want to make sure you're talking at a good pitch for you. Everybody's voice has a natural pitch range based on your physiology. And then, you know, depending on how you learn how to use it, you can potentially expand that. But there's going to be a pitch area that's a good pitch for you to talk in. This is usually in the bottom third of your voice, and it's going to be in this what's called modal register or chest voice, kind of like I'm talking right now. If you're talking too high, you're taking your voice out of its ideal place, and that makes it harder. If you talk too low, you're often pressing on the voice or pushing on it, and you're going to add a lot of impact and can run into difficulties that way. If you have concerns about your voice tiring or feeling like it might not be the right pitch for you, that would be a good time to check in with the voice therapist. It's also a good idea to think about budgeting your voice use. If you're having difficulties or if you just want to make sure your voice use on a regular basis is pretty consistent, think about what the most important things are for you to use your voice. Do you have a lecture? Do you have patients to see? Do you have recreational activities where you want to use your voice? And you can kind of think about if those are where you want to spend your voice. We all have a limit. We're all going to hit the wall if we do too much. So you want to find a level of regular voice use that you can manage. If you're running into difficulties with fatigue or pain or your voice tiring out by the end of the day, that's a great time to look at where you're spending your voice. And if even for the short term, you might want to make some changes or readjust it. You can think about if you really need to say everything that you've been saying or if there are times when, for example, like with physical therapy, you don't really need to provide the instructions every single time somebody does a task, but what's a minimum you might be able to use once somebody knows what they're doing. Nonverbal communication is another route to reducing voice use when it's necessary. If you can point, if you can gesture, if you can cue somebody with another way, go right ahead. Clapping hands, turning off and on lights or strategies teachers often use to get people's attention. Are there things you can do in your practice and in your situation that would you allow you to communicate things but not use your voice? In some settings, putting up a sign with all the instructions or information can do that for you too. Another option for healthy voice use is to think about using your resonance. There are ways we can use our vocal tract to boost our sound and actually inhibit our voice. And when we get that boost, we actually help the vocal folds vibrate better and our voice will project better so we'll be heard better. Those are things that a voice therapist or a speech language pathologist can teach you how to do.
Um, also, it's a lot of what voice teaching in all genres is about, is working with that resonance. Amplification is another option. A lot of teachers are moving towards doing this in the classroom. It's been shown to be helpful not only for the teacher in maintaining their vocal health or dealing with it if they have vocal difficulties, but it's also found to benefit some of the students as far as their ability to pay attention and follow along. So in certain settings, amplification is certainly an option and something to consider. So let's talk through some exercises that you can do. These might be things you put together to create your warm up or cool down, might be things you do throughout the day. The lion is the first stretch we'll talk about. And for that one, you're going to open your mouth and stick out your tongue as far as you can. It's a lion face. I think of the Chinese lions that have their mouth wide open and their tongue sticking out. It's also a yoga move. So you can try that. The tongue all the way out as if you're trying to touch your chin and the mouth wide open. So go ahead and do that. You may feel burning in the back of your tongue. That's great. That's what we're looking for. The masseter is the muscle that runs from our cheekbone to our jaw, and it can often use a good stretch. So what you can do is put the heel of your hand on your cheekbone, and you're going to slowly slide that down as you open your mouth and go all the way down to the jawline. You end up in the middle kind of with the home alone face or the painting the scream with your mouth wide open and your hands on the sides. And this is a great stretch for people who use their voice. Go ahead and give it a try. And then for our jaw stretch, what you do is you can take your hand, usually I put kind of the crook between my thumb and my index finger on my chin, and I gently pull my chin down. This stretches the jaw out. If you have any issues with TMJ, um, do not do the stretch. If you feel your jaw joint clicking or popping or gets painful, I would back off and not do this one either. But you can pull down and get it all stretched out. It can also be helpful to massage under your chin. That's your tongue directly behind your chin. You can just massage there with your thumb and that can help relax things. Abdominal breathing is a great thing to check in with. What you're looking for when you breathe is that you want to feel your belly expand. So the diaphragm comes down and your guts have to go somewhere and what they're going to do is they're going to expand out. So as you breathe in, feel the abdominal muscles relax and your belly expand out. Try it right now. Sip some breath in as if you're breathing through a straw with your hand over your belly button and think about what you notice. Did you feel your belly move? If you did, that's what we're looking for. If you didn't, keep trying, and that can be something you check in with some folks about if you aren't able to figure it out over time. We also want to keep our chest still, so if you put your hand on your sternum, try that sipping breath again. Feel the belly expand, but keep the sternum stable. Good. So that can be something you check in with, just as simply as that. You can also do some breathing exercises. And what you want to do is you're going to breathe in with that abdominal breath, and we're going to exhale on an S, we'll say for four counts. So we're going to breathe in for two and out for four. So breathe in one, two, good. And you can keep doing that, breathing in for a certain count and breathing out for a certain count. Often this ratio of breathing is like a one to two, you can play with different things. You can also do a couple different sounds. We did S, Z, F, V, and also a SH or a Z sound can be very good for working on breathing. That brings us to glides. Most of the time we are talking in the lower part of our voice and we really don't go into our upper voice that often. But for exercising purposes, if you think about it, you want to do your full range of motion. So we should do the full range of motion for our voice. We're going to work with what's called a buzzy ooh or a straw glide. 
I'm going to demonstrate the buzzy ooh, but you can also do it putting a straw between your lips and feeling like you're kind of creating a hum or a buzz through the straw. So for the buzzy ooh, you want your lips closed. So it's not just a regular ooh, but really, really small. And you want to feel that it vibrates almost like a kazoo. I can really feel my lips vibrating when I do that more than when I just do ooh. Lots of good vibration when we do the buzzy ooh. Then you're going to start low in your range, and you're going to go high. Okay, keep in mind, I did a lot of singing. Your range might not be as large. It might be larger. Don't worry about it. Your voice is where your voice is at. If you have a break or a jump in the middle, that's okay. That's actually pretty normal, unless you've worked on reducing that. And guys, if you go and you flip into a falsetto or like a Mickey Mouse Miss Piggy sound, that's okay. That's just one way of getting your upper voice. We want to do the glide up. We also want to do the glide down. And only go as low as you can actually make a pitch. The point is not to go down and make growling sounds. With the glides, you can do it like we just did, or you can have a cup with about an inch of water in it and put your straw into that. And what you do is you blow bubbles, and then you do your glides up and down, blowing actually into the water. A lot of people like this when their voice is bothering them. That can help get the vocal folds a little more relaxed, get them set up with how you want them vibrating, and kind of re revitalize your voice for the rest of the day. Now it's in that sense a stopgap because you want to make some changes probably to how you're using your voice if you need to do this in the middle of the day, but it can be a, again a great opportunity to refresh. You can do glides with the cup and bubble, you can do long notes just holding the note out, or you can do kind of loop-de-loos, all sorts of different patterns. Humming is very good for our voice. It works with our resonance, so lining up the vocal tract in a way to boost the sound of the voice. Just an easy mm-hmm, feeling the vibrations in your face. Oftentimes people feel their lips, in their nose, in their cheeks. We want to feel some nice vibrations in our face, and we want to keep things easy. Mm-hmm. So you can just try that a few times. A few mm-hmm. and see if you notice vibrations. If you didn't, keep playing with it. What you can also do is use that when you're talking to other people and use your mm-hmm, mm, 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 mm within the conversation, those I'm being a good listener sounds, to check in with your own voice and get ready for when you want to talk. You can practice phrases with lots of M's, like my mother makes many muffins, and that helps you get a nice, buzzy, vibrant feel into your whole talking. We want to feel those vibrations and that easy production with our speech. One way to do that and build it into your conversation is to practice phrases you say regularly. So if you always say, good morning, class, that would be a great one to practice. If you start sessions with, okay, how did this last week go? that would be another good one to practice. And you might have 10, 15 phrases you regularly practice and fee try to get this humming feel into it. And again, if you have difficulty with that, that's where you might want to work with the speech language pathologist who can help you find that resonant, vibrant, easy place in your voice. The last item is a checkup. It's a way to get an idea of how your voice is doing and it's actually recommended that you do it twice a day. So this could be part of your warm up and your cool down. You just try it out first thing in the day and see how the voice is doing. You'll get an idea of what's going on because if all of a sudden you can't go as high or sing as soft as you usually do, it might mean that you're having some trouble, you're getting some swelling on the vocal folds. If that goes on for several days, it might be an indication, well, you're getting sick or a sign that something's going on with the way your voice is vibrating and the way your voice is working. So oftentimes the first phrase of happy birthday to you is used, just singing it really high and light, 
happy birthday to you. Okay, and feeling that it's pretty easy. You don't have to work hard. And if that's going like normal, you're doing pretty good. If you want to watch the full video that explains it, it's an ENT from Chicago, Bastion, that uses this and developed it. And he has a, about a 15 minute video talking about the whole um, purpose behind it, rationale, and then going through the exercises. It's a little more involved, but the principle is if you can sing high and soft, you're doing okay. Well, without adding extra effort, you're doing okay. So let's talk about rehabilitation. How do I know if I have a voice problem? Well, the first thing is, let's see what your symptoms are. These are some of the things people that are having voice difficulties notice. Hoarseness, breathiness and roughness in the voice is very common. Your throat might feel tired or achy. Um, it might take a lot more effort and actually be painful to talk or to sing. You might find your range is reduced, especially the high range. So no, that makes sense with our check. Can you still do that? You also might find that your only option is to be at a moderate sound level or to be loud. So you can't make soft sounds anymore. Again, that's part of why our check-in includes both of those things. The voice might break or crack more often, and you might be losing your voice or only be able to produce soft talking. So these are things we look for and are, are signs that something is going on with the voice. Now, how long do you wait? The consensus is that if you go two to three weeks without there really being a reason for these things, then you want to start getting it checked out. Um, a reason might be you just had a cold and you're still hoarse. A reason you might have a tired, achy throat is you're becoming sick. Uh, it might be that you went to a hockey game and you yelled too much. But if it doesn't go away within a couple weeks of being sick, or if it do, there really isn't kind of an instigating factor and it stays with you for those two to three weeks, that's when you want to get it checked out. Generally, you start with your primary care physician. They're going to look at, again, the whole system. Think about, is there something that could be causing the laryngitis or other difficulties? In general, you want to avoid multiple rounds of antibiotics. Occasionally, we will have patients referred to the ENT who the primary care provider just kept throwing antibiotic after antibiotic at them to try and get at it from the idea that it was a bacterial laryngitis. You know, one round of antibiotic, again, I'm not an MD, but trying out one round of antibiotic is probably sufficient in most cases. And at that point, what you want is a referral to be seen by an ENT, an ear, nose, and throat doctor, also called an otolaryngologist. So when you go to the ENT, you will give a history of what's been going on with your voice, and there'll be an exam. And almost always there will be visualization of the vocal folds. That's that scope we saw in the earlier slides. It'll go through the nose and hang over the throat and allow either the ENT or the SLP to see what the vocal folds look like. The reasons we need to visualize the vocal folds is that sometimes something that sounds very severe, really organically or structurally, doesn't have a lot going on or because something that sounds minor could actually be pretty major depending on what's going on with the vocal folds. So the things we look for is uh, lumps and bumps. Do the vocal folds have that nice even edge we saw in the picture or are there changes to it? And when there are changes to the structure or the movement, the ability of the anatomy to move, that's very much a medical diagnosis. And sometimes those things need surgical, medical, um, medication interventions, and those are managed by the ENT. Or sometimes the, you go in there and you look at the vocal folds and everything looks great, but we've got someone who has a sound that doesn't work for them or they're fatiguing really fast. And that's usually more related to function or how the voice is being used. In both situations, patients may be referred to voice therapy. Therapy is usually six to eight weeks in duration and meeting one time for 45 to 60 minutes. 
it does require regular practice. So if you have played an instrument or learned a sport or danced, you know, it's not just the training sessions. It's all that extra practice you put in on your own that makes a difference. So it's usually three to five minutes of practicing multiple times a day. It'll be a variety of exercises, kind of like some of the things we did that could be part of your warm up, as well as working on changing how you habitually use your voice. Sometimes surgery will be recommended depending on the location of the surgery and depending on how much it actually affects the mucosa of the vocal folds. I frequently recommend that if people are professional voice users and surgery is being recommended that they get a second opinion. It's entirely possible you will be told exactly the same thing, but it's worth getting checked out because you can end up with permanent scarring or difficulties following voice surgery. So you definitely, if you're looking at surgery, you want the doctors to go through all the risk factors with you as well. So this brings us to the end of our presentation on vocal health. The things you want to consider as you go forth using your voice is what you can do systemically to take care of your body and to take care of your voice, what you can do about your habitual voice use to keep it healthy and avoid doing things that could injure the voice, and then when to recognize that you're having difficulties and seek medical intervention. Thank you very much for joining me for this recording of the Lunch and Learn from Altru Health System Physical Occupational and Speech Therapy. I hope you've enjoyed it, and please feel free to email me if you have any questions. Thank you.